Welcome to Talks at Google. Today with us, Stefan Alexander. Following the great minds that first drew links between music and physics, The Jazz of Physics, the book that Stefan has in sales right now. Uh, the Jazz of Physics accompanies Stefan Alexander's own tale from taking music lessons as a boy in the Bronx to studying theoretical physics at Imperial College. Covering the universe from its birth to its fate, its structure on the smallest and largest scales, the book will inspire anyone interested in the mysteries of our universe, music, and life itself. Alexander is a physics professor at Brown. He did research here uh, in the neighborhood uh, at SLAC at Stanford. He's the winner of the 2013 American Physical Society Boucher Award. He's also a jazz musician and recently recorded his first electronic jazz album with Erin Ryu. Upcoming album uh, with Grammy, uh, uh, Grammy Award winner Will Calhoun and Melvin Gibbs will hit the stores in, in a year. So please join me in welcoming Stefan Alexander to Google. Well, it's, I would like to say it's a great pleasure to, um, to be here. It's actually a great pleasure to be back. I attended SciFu twice in the past and had given a previous Google talk of a different nature a couple of years ago. Um, hopefully this time I won't be sweating. That's a, I mean, I, I meant that figuratively. Um, so um, anyway, yeah, so let's begin with the, with the talk. Um, so um, I want to first talk about why I wrote the book. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. My family um, immigrated from the Caribbean, from Trinidad to the Bronx. And back in those days, back in those, those days, um, my grand, you know, for, for Afro-Caribbeans, a one way to economic freedom was to become a musician. All right, or to play sports. So it was in the mind of my grandmother for me to become a, music, a concert pianist. So I started off with concert piano. But I was more interested, I realized, I was an inquisitive kid like many of us are who grew up to become scientists, right? We're just inquisitive about the world around, around you. And for me, I wanted to understand why was it that the music was sounding interesting rather than playing the music? So it started at that age. I started to realize that I really didn't, when I looked at musicians around me at, at that time, in the 80s in the Bronx, where rap music, hip hop music was being um, innovated, um, I really didn't relate, I mean, to the way they were being personified in the media, for example. So I really didn't fit in with that. And this has to do with identity now. As I progressed along in high school, Dewitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, I discovered Mr. Kaplan, who was my physics teacher, and he was also a jazz musician, a professional jazz musician. And he was the one that exposed me to physics. And yet, when I looked and I saw what scientists, I didn't really relate to that. So I was kind of, throughout my life and my career, um, it's always been this kind of dichotomy in a sense. And my music and my physics life were very much separate, deliberately separate from each other. I used to play in you know, clubs late at night. And during the daytime, you know, the usual stuff, go and do calculations as a postdoc. And then, you know, some things um, started to ignite more of a, uh, some sort of, you know, healthy, healthy symbiosis between my physics and my, my music life. And um, the book is a part of, writing the book was part of that reconciliation process. So in a lot of ways, this book is really also a personal thing um, in the sense that it's, it's about that journey. But it's also about other things, and that's kind of what I want to talk about as well today. So what were some of the influences that really like, you know, influenced me as I was growing up in the Bronx? Well, there's this guy, Rakim, who many people deem to be the greatest MC ever, period. Okay? Now, back in those days, Rakim belonged to a group of individuals called themselves the Five Percenters. And they believed in something called supreme mathematics. So you had these guys in the Bronx that were talking about alien life forms and you know, coming up with their own sort of scientific theories about how the world worked. And Rakim was one of them, but he dropped an album called um, Eric B's President, um, I'm sorry, the, the, um, My Melody, and here's a quote from that. That's what I'm saying, I drop signs like a scientist. My melody's a code, the very next episode. Has the mic off and distorted and ready to explode. I keep the mic at Fahrenheit, freeze MC to make him colder. The listener's system is kicking like solar. So I remember as like, you know, a 12, 13-year-old kid, 
you know, where science and, you know, life of the mind, in a sense, was not what society was telling us we should become, and having like the greatest MC, you know, embracing scientific thought. And that was uh, something that stuck in my mind. So I, I thank Rakim for, you know, for making me feel like I belong to something um, in this sense, like, you know, so that was one person. The other person was Albert Einstein. I discovered Albert Einstein when I was eight years old in the Museum of Natural History. I got snuck off to the side from the dinosaurs and, and I saw this picture of this guy and I, I saw these equations, and I, was, I, I thought this was some kind of hidden code, and I wanted to understand that. And that stuck in my mind, um, Albert Einstein. And then finally, what, one of the things that also, again, what we're looking at just moments throughout my life, um, John Coltrane. And one of the main subjects of, this, um, of my talk today will be this diagram. This is a hand-drawn diagram given, gifted uh, from John Coltrane to his friend and mental partner, um, sort of like they, they used to theorize a lot together, Yusuf Latif, Dr. Yusuf Latif. And he gave this to Yusuf Latif as a birthday present. And in 2005, I actually had the honor to speak to Yusuf Latif about this diagram. And this was one of the things that got me thinking about what this diagram has to do with physics. OK, and I'll, I'll get back to that and tell you what that has to do with physics. But also with the important thing that one of the great heroes and icons of jazz music and music in general, John Coltrane, is you know, analyzing his music through the lens of something that he got from Albert Einstein. This is the book. You, um, it's about uniting science and music again, because I'm not doing anything new. Um, Again, in the sense that I'll, I'll get back to the again part, but how did this really happen? When did I really start saying, OK, you know what? I'm just going to bring the physics and the music together. Um, it happened with this individual. How many people recognize this individual? OK, how many people recognize the people down there? OK, it's Bono and David Bowie, and that's Brian Eno. Brian, um, and that's Brian Eno, as you know, he's for, in, in the eyes of many, known to be the greatest programmer of the DX7 um, frequency modulated synthesis. And um, so when I was a postdoc at Imperial College in London, um, it was a very um, interesting time for me because it was a time where, as many of us who were postdocs know that, you kind of have to do something interesting. <laughs> and I was, um, at the time, it was the name of the game in, in the year 2000 was string theory, OK, and early universe cosmology, in this case, cosmic inflation. And my thing there was to try to bring them together. So at the time I was working on this project, um, taking a risk in terms of trying to put these two, two things together, which I was successful at doing, by the way. Um, but, um, but at that time, I was kind of stressed out. And I was also considering that I, I would actually leave graduate, leave, leave, quit physics and maybe become a musician. And I became friends with Brian Eno. That's a long story how we became friends, but it's in the book. Um, and on my way to work, I would stop by his studio, OK, and hang out with him. We put in the order four days a week over a period of two years. So we became, you know, he became like a mentor of mine. And one day, I'm, I came into his office, and um, I came into his office, and I, up to the left-hand corner, I saw basically the, him playing on a large computer screen with these like square figures, and I thought that he had lost it because, he, <laughs> you know, I thought he was playing with like virtual Lego or something like that. I kept coming in day after day, and he started playing more and more of this stuff. At some point, he stopped and told me the idea um, at the time of, of cellular automata. Um, and he, the, the basic notion that you have these simple rules of, of your neighbors, in this case, and you can generate very complex patterns um, from very simple rules. And that fit very nicely with Brian's past work in generative music um, and one of his philosophy towards composition that you can read about if you get um, various books on Brian, you know, or look him up on YouTube. <laughs> Um, 
And you're looking down here at one of the pictures that, that he can generate using cellular automata um, out of the millions of pictures that you know, can occur from cellular automata. And at that time, I said, well, wait a minute, this is interesting. It finally congealed that Brian is actually freely important ideas in a very creative way from science into his art and into his music and you know doing a successful job but more importantly not really caring too much about what others thought and I realized at the time that really what I was battling against was that was caring about what other people thought and also you know the fear of risk risk taking in this case um, so I just decided that I was going to just if I was going to go out of physics, I was just going to go out my way. So then I started really bringing together my physics and my music world, my, in particular my, my jazz world together. And so um, some of the ways I would do that was I would go to jazz clubs and bring my physics papers with me, right? And do my calculations there. And then interesting things started happening. I would, in between playing sets, I would come back and do a calculation, but the, mo the most interesting part was talking to the jazz musicians. I discovered that jazz cats, okay, are, are basically uber nerds themselves, and that you start talking about physics, the stuff you're working on, like they find it very interesting, and they're like, you know, uh, a, a good soundboard, and they have their own ideas, and that. That level of, of interaction, even though they didn't really know the physics I was working on, per se, they always had something interesting to tell me. And that process, okay, of sort of opening up the conversation and, um, of, uh, and making my research world inclusive to them really helped me think differently about my research. Um, vice versa, I started to realize that when I was hanging out with my, doing research with my physics colleagues, especially people like Chris Isham, I don't know if you know Chris, is a very well-known mathematical physicist, um, that the way that we were doing our research was very similar to what jazz musicians were doing. So that we were just improvising with, math, with equations and concepts. We were taking known things that we had mastered, all right, you know, differential ge geometry, in Chris's case, topos theory, and we were trying to create something new with that known stuff. Just like jazz musicians were using scales, melody, harmony, rhythm, all these things, and in real time, spontaneously creating something new. So I, that, the, those two worlds started to merge. And now let me um, say, get a little bit more concrete, and now we're going to um, really talk about some physics and some, some music here. And, um, for the rest of this talk, we'll, we'll use, so you all know this already, but since I am, I'm, you know, the world is looking, I should say a few words here. If I take a vibrating string and we're looking up here at a string, what, can I point, can I point from something like this? Um, so if I look at the top here, we see that that's what we call a fundamental. The string basically is held at, at, at two endpoints and it's oscillating back and forth. And that is what we call the lowest frequency, okay? The second is we do, if we divide the string in half, we find that the string basically um, has half the wavelength of the fundamental. We can divide the fundamental fun, fun, into, into a third, its, its um, length, and so on and so forth. And so if I were to play those things starting in C, the question is, what would I get? If I start with the fundamental, if I play C, if I go up, if I double the frequency or half the wavelength, I get a high C, an octave. Any guess what, what I would get if I divided by a third? Or I would get the G, the perfect fifth. If I did it by a quarter, I would get the F, the perfect fourth. And of course, like, you know, the, the perfect fifth and the, what we call the, the fundamental, the five to the one, is a very powerful um, chord progression, all right? Um, so that's used a lot in many we you know, Western classical jazz music, and we'll get back to that. 
And so what is it? Well, we see a direct connection between the harmonics, the so-called notion of that the idea that waves, OK, could um, the vibration of waves could come together, basically, to make sounds. And not just pure tones, but even more complicated tones. OK, so what does this have to do with anything? The premise of my book is, um, is the following. One of the, in terms of it, the physics and where the physics meets the music. I assert in my book that after working as a theoretical phys physicist, you know, looking at things like quantum field theory, string theory, like even loop quantum gravity, even like theories of that form, that one of the central core ideas, regardless of what scale, okay, or what domain of, of physical reality we, we look at, it's the name of the game is about vibration, okay? The name of the game is about patterns of vibration, the physics of waves, if you like it. I mean, I can't tell you how many papers I've written or my colleagues have written over the last year. At the end of the day, we're doing some kind of Fourier transform. So, so that is seem, that, that's the sort of central idea from which now um, we can start looking at all these different ways that um, music Jazz music in particular, quantum mechanics, right, um, and more f and cosmology are connected. Okay, again, I'm not in this book saying that the universe is a jazz improvisation, right? It's a new way of talking about physics. The same way anyone that writes a popular science book, right, uses analogies, uses metaphor to talk about that, right? Otherwise, you just have a book full of equations. I'm just using my knowledge, okay, um, as a practicing musician. Uh, for, as a new way, a new lens to draw parallels between music and hopefully it ends up being a fun and an enlighten, enlightening read. So, um, so okay, let's talk about one, one more idea, and then, um, which is the Fourier idea. Very, probably one of the most important concepts in all of physics and engineering. And the basic idea is that at the end of the day, if we look at, look at this very complicated looking wave, Right? The, the idea of the Fourier wave uses the fact that if I drop two rocks in a pond, I'll have two simple waves emanating outwards, and these waves at some point will hit each other and create another wave pattern due to either constructive okay, or destructive interference of those waves. So the fact that waves can add up or subtract simple waves to, pr to, pr to give a more complicated um, wave the Fourier idea is nothing but that idea. So the idea here is that I can add up simple harmonic periodic waves that we just spoke about that I, I can understand purely in terms of integers. Right? The minute I specify an integer, I know something about the wave. So I can think of waves, these harmonic waves, as an alphabet. Just like I have A, B, C, D. Right? I can think of these, these building blocks as an alphabet from which I can combine to form complicated sounds or complicated wave patterns. So in this case, this complicated wave pattern is a sum of three of these, um, three harmonic waves. And it uses basically the idea that waves that are in phase can actually add up to create bigger waves, and waves that are out of phase, um, you can cancel, right? That's the basic physics. And we use this to talk about particle annihilation, for example. You know, for the physicists in the order, you do a Fourier decomposition of a mode expansion of the creation and annihilation operator. It's basically using the same idea, electron-positron annihilation. So you see, this idea is so powerful that I can use it right I can, at will throughout the book, and it brings a lot of things together. Okay. All right. So now let's. So I said this book is not. It's about connecting music and physics again. Because I wish someone would have told me when I was a student who was conflicted about being a musician or being a physicist or being a nobody, whatever, you know, I wish that someone would have told me that at the very birth of what we call our Western science, music and astronomy and, and mathematics, right, and what became physics were all unified. All right? And it begins actually with, with Pythagoras, um, who was the one that came up with um, the Pythagorean scale by basically looking at this thing called a monochord, a one-string instrument, and, and actually moving a bridge in these integer relations of the length of the string and generating the scale. Okay? And Pythagoras really believed in this idea of this harmony of the spheres. 
and it was later on his students like Plato and Aristotle that sought to geometrize this idea. So when Kepler, our very first astrophysicist, came on the scene after 2,000 years of people being stuck, right, the Ptolemaic models and all these epicycles, um, it was Kepler that really sought, at the end of the day, a physical cause for why the planets were moving. And he was stuck, as we, we recall, right? He was stuck because of Mars. Mars. Mars's orbit was so elliptical, you know, and he couldn't fit it in his platonic model. So he returned back to the Pythagorean thinking, realizing, after realizing that Plato was a Pythagorean. So then he started assigning, this is his own handwriting, he started to assign to the velocity. Here we're looking at um, a planet, the, like the sun, and a, a planet going around in an elliptic orbit, orbit around the sun. And what he did was uh, measure, um, assign the velocity closest to the sun and furthest away from the sun of that planet. And by assigning that velocity to a note, the ratios of those velocities, he was able to come up with these scales. Um, and it's kind of interesting that um, John Coltrane had an album called Interstellar Space. And he has a song called Mars. If you actually study the transcription of Mars, you find that it has um, inklings of um, this particular scale in it. All right? It's just a, you know, again, it's a conjecture. All right? There's no proof in there. But it's kind of interesting that John Coltrane wrote this album called Interstellar Space. So then from that, he was able to come up with his three laws of planetary motion. The first set of equations, really, right, that we started to assign to astrophysical phenomenon. This, of course, then led Newton. Newton was after the one equation that would replace this. And that's kind of interesting that musical thought was always with us, and at some point bifurcated into two separate things. That would then encourage young people like me to be confused about their, you know, where they fit. Um, so the lesson here is um, for all the other people out there um, watching this, it was never, you know, the music and the science was, you know, were never really separate from day one. Um, so we should, you know, we should feel free to, to, um, to play with both of them. Um, okay, so another thing that I, I do in the book, since I, yeah, I, the book is, we also use, I also use music as an analogy to understand a quantum world. So out of them, you know, I came up with a couple of really neat analogies that's supposed to sort of like evoke a sense of even more wonder in quantum mechanics, right? But also to maybe clarify some conceptual difficulties that even I had as a researcher, you know, feeling so comfortably, comfortable doing, writing the equations down of a Feynman path integral without really stepping back to think of like, okay, what's going on intuitively here? So this analogy with jazz improvisation kind of helped. All right, and I have to give some credit to the great jazz sax saxophonist Donald Harrison for simultaneously coming up with this idea, okay? Um, so the basic idea is the following. You know, we look at something like an electron, which is a quantum particle. Feynman taught us that the electron does not do what a macroscopic object do, which is that it traverses a very deterministic um, and unique path from, a, from the initial point to the final point. Instead, it does something else, okay? And what it does is really weird. What it does, it, according to Feynman, is that it considers all potential paths, this one electron, from point A to point B. Now, we would laugh at this and say, well, this is, this is ridiculous. This, there's no way this could happen. But then there are very precise experiments that test the difference between a particle going here and here. One experiment is called the of bohm effect, okay? Um, and when we study particle interactions at the LHC, right, there are many different paths that particles could take, and these things are measured at Large Hadron Collider as well. But there's another place where if this didn't happen, there'd be no um, point for Google to be interested. It's called quantum computation, all right? The sum of many paths, okay, is just a, a formulation of how qubits evolve. I mean, that's just another an, an aspect, except in that case, you're also looking at entangled states as well. But this whole idea of superposition, 
right, in quantum mechanics is really what's um, given this weird notion that the particle is traversing all possible paths between the begin beginning point and the end point. So that has, that, that just, you know, is so non-intuitive to me. For all the years I've worked on quantum mechanics and field theory and stuff, I just still don't get it. So I had to get some kind of other, you know, toehold on this. And it came from Sonny Rollins, okay, and Charlie Parker. So what we're looking at here is a line that Sonny Rollins, um, a transcribed line that Sonny Rollins soloed in improvisation. And what we see here is that there's a beginning note, which is um, a D, and it ends on a G. And as I said, they're perfect fourths. They're harmonically related to each other. So this is the idea in, in, in jazz improvisation. There are different strategies that improvisers can employ. And one strategy is the idea of targeting. So the idea of targeting is that you know what be beginning note you're going to begin with, and you have a sense of the end note. And what happens in between right, are many possible paths that could be taken. Now, this is happening in real time. So in real time, what, what note Sonny Rowland plays here, as opposed to some other note, is that he would consider all possible notes at every step. Right? The previous note does, of course, inform what the next note would be. Right? And that's also a quantum mechanical thing as well. Right? So the idea here is that all possible notes are being considered to traverse the begin, you know, how you get from the beginning point to the end point. Right? And that, is, that captures, in a sense, what's happening with the quantum particle, which is that you're not necessarily traversing literally all paths, but all paths are potential considerations. Okay? That is informed okay, by the previous notes, but also informed by the end point. So I found it to be a very interesting analogy. Um, the book gets into it in far more detail, so you know, um, I only have a half an hour to talk about this, and I have more things to talk about. The other thing I talk about, the, the main thrust of my book, though, it's a book at the end of the day about modern cosmology. And it's a book about structure formation. One of the biggest questions that we ask as cosmologists is, what, how did the large-scale structure in the universe emerge? And could the laws of physics known to us, or every bit of physics that we know, from microscopic physics to the gravitational physics that we think we know, could it account for what we see? So what we're looking at here is a computer simulation that matches okay, large-scale structure data of networks of galaxies. Okay? What we see here is um, five, if you look at focusing on this little box here, 500 million light years. And as we continue to focus in, we see clusters of galaxies. And the question is, how did 14 billion years ago, before this network of cosmic structure formed, how did a featureless universe filled with radiation energy develop into this? And in my book, I go through um, that this has to do with sound. That this is now a picture of the 14 billion years um, the CMB data of the, of the tiny fluctuations and the radiation of this plasma in the early universe that acted as a primordial seeds that grew into stars and galaxies, that grew into the structure. So the idea here is to sort of take the Pythagorean idea of music of the spheres and sort of bring it into this modern context. Except the question is that the music that we're going to get is not necessarily only harmonic, right? <laughs> It might look something a little bit more like jazz, as an analogy. And so, um, yes, we do know that when the, the correct physics to un understand that data is the physics of sound. So what we're looking at here um, is um, hot regions in this plasma and cold regions. And you can think of this, this plasma as a density, right? Nothing more than a density wave, which is a, what a sound wave is. And this sound waves actually has a harmonic motion. And those regions, OK, where we have resonance, where we have basically the most energy in the wave, are the ones that develop eventually, that, whose energies co energy collapse gravitationally to form the first stars. Okay.
So it's really a sound phenomenon. The universe did begin. The structure that we belong to, this complicated network of structure, literally began with sound. So then I started to push this analogy further in the book. And um, started to push the analogy further and to think about, well, what is music? If you really think about what music is. Well, there are many different definitions, and everyone has a different, every culture has a different way of thinking about music, how music functions to them. But one way you can think about music is that it's, people say it's structured sound. OK? Well, if the universe started off as some sort of sound pattern and developed into structure, right, then I can then use this analogy that, well, it's a particular structure of, of a sound phenomenon. And it's kind of interesting that people like Bach and, Le and Leggetti, composers like that, played with fractal music. They have self-similar structures actually in the music as it unfolds in time. And the distribution of galaxies does have a self-similar type of feel. It's not really a fractal. People did you know, um, debate that for a while. But it does have a structure. So um, you know, in the book, I kind of like play with that a little bit, right? So we have like you know a way of, you know, a, a, um, you know, making analogs between quantum mechanics and jazz improvisation. We now talk about the structure of the universe, and of course, we know that our early universe is actually what our early universe is a quantum place, right? One of the big questions right now. Right up, up the street, um, your friends um, up the street at Stanford um, spent a lot of time and energy thinking into the quantum early universe and how that universe basically became classical. And it, we believe it has something to do with the phenomena called cosmic inflation. So now I can bring together the quantum part of the jazz of physics right, with this classical part, which is the structure formation. And the question is, these initial sound waves okay, um, had to come from something quantum. And so I, I, I discuss that in the book. But I think the most exciting part of my book is not necessarily about drawing analogies and talking about known physics. But I also use the book as a device to say, can we actually learn new things? Can I actually use this analogy to actually do new physics? And so while writing the book, as you will see, I develop a new theory by drawing an analogy, this analogy further and was able to publish a very nice paper recently in uh, Physics Letters B based on this idea with uh, my colleague Marcelo Gleiser and my grad student Sam Cormack. And this idea goes as following, OK? And then, then I'm, I'm done too. Um, so it, let's go back to this diagram. This diagram, basically, what it reveals is cycles. Basically, you, have a, you, you see that the, these clusters of notes, I don't have time to go into it. But you see that what we have is a 60-fold cycle. This system, these notes repeat themselves every 60 times, just like a clock repeats itself every 12 times. And Coltrane is basically looking at intervallic relationships between very interesting scales and how they fit into this geometry. Coltrane was a very big fan. His biggest idol was Albert Einstein. And he got Einstein's idea of invariance, the idea of using symmetry all right, to understand what remains invariant if I change perspective. In this case, the speed of light remains invariant. And to have that, you need a four-dimensional space-time um, um, structure all right, that related, basically, length contraction and time dilation under these transformations. Coltrane tried to do the same thing in this diagram. I don't have the time, time to get into it, but if you read the book, I, I, I developed that okay, fully. Um, but the important thing there was the idea of using these harmonic cycles that Coltrane employed. And like, so for example, in Giant Steps, you see like he'll do, have cycles that go to and so on and so forth, right? Um, so, so the idea here is to try to take this analogy of how a jazz improviser might improvise. So one thing that could happen, that happens, is that you have the structure of the music. Let's consider the 12 bar blues. You have Four beats per bar, 12 bars. And that harmonic structure repeats itself in, in a cycle. All right? The rhythmic structure also repeats itself. And the improviser gets a solo, will get a chance every time around this, this cycle to try a different improvisation. So one of the questions that we were trying to understand is the so-called how to deal with the fine tuning of the coupling constants in nature. 
And one idea to, to, re, to resolve this issue, we, we, you know, life depends, right? We can't have carbon-based life if carbon weren't formed um, and to, um, from stars. And you can't have that, OK, if the tuning of the forces were within a few percentage of each other, right? If those ratios of those forces. So that, what determines those, those forces, the strength of those forces, we don't know the answer to that. And one idea is that there's a multiverse. And many of you probably heard these talks. What we came up with was a different idea here, using this idea of jazz improvisation. And the idea, again, is that you have now, um, and actually, there's a, this is the basic cycle. It has to do with this sound called the pentatonic scale if there's time. And the basic idea now if, is the following. That instead of having a multiverse, like here are different island universes that are causally out of contact with each other, you have a universe that undergoes, a, you know, that is cyclic in the sense that um, it expands, contracts into a Big Bang, expands and contracts, and just does that indefinitely. OK, it does that indefinitely. Um, but every time it actually runs into this so-called Big Bang, the coupling constants of nature, of all the forces, undergo a quasi-random walk. It improvises. And as you expand out, it gets fixed. And we just happen to live in the epoch okay, where the coupling constants evolve, like a genetic code, okay, like a genetic mutation, to actually have the value that we have. So what's really cool about this? We use this analogy from, from music, like, just like Kepler did. But when we did the equations, it, bang, it worked bang on. So if, if I invite you to read that paper, you'll see it has, not, you know, of course, there's an idea. But the thing that was remarkable was when we actually looked at the low energy effective action of the heterotic string, right? It, um, it, it, the equations just presented themselves so beautifully. So again, it just you know, shows that that really you know, embracing this idea of musical thought could be very useful right, in, in research, in my case, in theoretical physics. Um, if there's a little second, I would like to maybe play something for you. Um, yeah. um, so as I said, Coltrane's, um, I want to do a quick sort of physics um, thing for you, which is that I told you that in the harmonics of the waves, the most consonant relationship, aside from the octave, is a perfect fifth. And that happens purely from the energetics of the wave. So it's purely physical. Any vibration I make, right, and I, I, any vibration will contain this perfect fifth in it, okay, with a different amplitude, of course, but it's still there. So for example, if I play the D, and I don't move my fingers, right, I get the A. That A is here. So the perfect fifth is contained in this D. So you say, OK, so what? So let me, con let me continue playing sequences of perfect fifths. All right, so I just played um, a bunch of perfect fifths. I'm going to reorganize the perfect, those perfect fifths in uh, ascending order from lowest note to highest note. That's a pentatonic scale. Now, one thing that's interesting is that that scale has been used right, in most cultures. It's a one scale. But let me add, let me do some more things with that pentatonic scale. That's a blues scale. So the point here is that one of the most used scale in all of our is just, right, is just a sophistication, a tiny sophistication over a scale that is just generated naturally from the laws of physics, just from the perfect fifth relation. And so it's no mistake why a love supreme, one of Coltrane's greatest work, right, is rooted in this pentatonic scale. <laughs> 
So when Coltrane told David Amram, the great composer, that I, like Einstein, I am seeking for something simple that brings music together from natural sources, it couldn't be nothing but this pentatonic scale. All right, so let me just see if I can play something fun. <laughs> Since we're at the cyclical universe, what was uh, with the expansion? The, the type Wait. 1A supernovae? The expansion of what? The type 1A supernovae results. Oh, dark energy, yes, yes. So um, I had nothing or very little to say in my book about dark energy because my book was really focusing on the early universe, the high energy universe. Um, um, but I did recently publish a paper um, with some colleagues about dark energy um, about a month ago, but um, it's, not, it doesn't, it's not related to, this, to the book. Um. I, w I was just um, <laughs> wondering, what, what's special about physics you, uh, in terms of your analogies and your kind of parallel? So you, know, you talk about jazz, and jazz creates some um, structure. Jazz uh, lends itself to multiple paths. You know, it, um, and I was thinking, well, what's, you could apply this these analogies and parallels to almost anything, anything in the world that has structure like biology. Biology has, you know, you think of DNA getting from, you know, a set of genes and how they're randomly put together to create structure and how plants have self symmetry. And how, while you're in the middle of your talk, my brain just trans, you know, translated physics to biology. And so, yeah. what, what is special about physics other than well, you're a physicist? I don't think, to be honest, I don't think there's anything special about physics. I think that what's special about this is that, you know, as a physicist and as someone that's played around a lot with music, I just wanted to have those two worlds speak to each other and found lots of interesting parallels. But also, it helped me do better research. And, you know, like, so I would encourage biologists and other people to start seriously, you know. I mean, the book was, you know, as a labor of love for me. Um, it was my it's my first book, so it took, a, took me quite a while and a lot of thought to write it. And so it was a... The, the byproduct, the after effects of it, is um, someone that now has a little bit more integrative knowledge of these two fields. And so it, it's, it maybe it was a selfish thing for me. So I think what was special about it for me was just the act of writing the book and finding these new parallels that I didn't know about before. But I think that it's, there's nothing special. I think that um, in this analogy making game, right, you're going to always find these overlapping domains. And then there's something interesting there because then where they overlap and where the analogies break down is where something interesting might flourish. And in the book I talk about, I go into, the, it's really also a book for me about, about doing research. I mean, when I work with my graduate students, right, the question is how do I enable them to be better researchers? Not to just learn physics, but how to do it, how to write new papers, how to come up with new ideas. And this way of, you know, I realized that all of my years trying to be a jazz improviser, right, and playing spontaneously on the spot with other people and having them support me and su functioning with that group of people, not being selfish, all these things are, are elements in the research front that, that I found to be very useful with, my, with how I interact with my colleagues, how I interact with students. And so I do think there is something special, but I, don't, but I also think that um, if you do this analogy making with other fields, there'll be something special and unique there as well, too. Could you explain that uh, Coltrane diagram since you didn't have time to get? Okay, to sure. All right. 
so, um, so there's the Coltrane diagram again, and, this, and going back to your thing. So the diagram, I think, was one interesting thing is that a lot of jazz, not all, are sort of trying to do a similar thing. They want to come up with their own sort of system because some kind of geometric or mathematical system because that enables them to think more economically about how to improvise, right? Because you know, there's many thousands of different scales, you know, you're playing, what do you do? So a lot of, um, a lot of improvisers come up with tricks of the trade. Um, so this diagram was, I claim was some sort of thing that Coltrane was trying to systematize, relationship between scales and harmonic relations that was important to him. So what you see here, again, is a 60-sided cycle. Now, um, in terms of math, there's something called cyclical groups, all right? So the group Z12 is a group uh, mod 12, right, where you go around 12 times and you come back to yourself, all right? So Z60 is a 60-fold cycle. So you have, you, if you really look closely, you have 60 notes there. And then you, what happens there, you see you have clusters of those 60 notes, three clusters of notes. If you actually start with the C and you go around, I can't point out. That actually is a very important um, scale that I think Messiaen Messi or Schoenberg, one of those people who did group theory, okay, applied group theory to music. Um, this song called the All Intervallic Tetrachord. And there are two of them. And the, that, that, that system exists in this diagram. The other thing that also is that that's very important here is that you have the whole tone scale. All right? Giant Steps is basically based on the, the um, augmented triad. Um, so, but you, you can actually make two whole tone scales out of that. And these are what we call symmetric scales. All right? These are scales that literally look symmetric when you, when you geometrize them in terms of these cycles, these cyclical symmetries. The other thing that, that's important here is something called a tritone, which is a reflection. It's that if I reflect along C and I come back down here, I get the tritone. And that's, that maintains itself in this diagram. So it's sort of like a, hyper, a higher dimensional version of our 12-tone scale that contains right, scalar relationships in the geometry. All right? And you can now ask yourself, you can think about now relativity theory. In relativity theory, as you know, if I, if I, if, you know, what relativity, special relativity tells me is that, you know, if I have two observers moving at some velocity with respect to each other, length will be contracted for the fast moving observer relative to the observer that's not moving, right? And also time will be dilated, meaning so, you know, the rate at which a clock will tick for that moving observer will slow down relative to the observer that's not moving, relative to that observer's clock. Well, so those things are relative concepts. Space and time intervals are relative concepts at the expense of the speed of light actually being the same in both frames of reference. So there's something invariant about that geometry, right? of those, those spatio-temporal relationships, okay? There's something invariant there, which is the speed of light, which basically retains the length of the four-dimensional geometry. So the thing that's actually invariant, right, is the four-dimensional lengths measured in the four-dimensional length, right? So Coltrane tried to, I believe, he read everything he could get his hands on by Einstein. He was trying to find, okay, that, you know, these different scalar relationships are kind of relative to each other in this geometry. But the thing that's invariant is the 60-fold cycle. Okay, and that's a basic idea. Now, of course, I, in the book, kind of go into, right, I try to develop the language so that, you know, even if you know nothing about music theory, like by the time you get to the end of the book, you're like, okay, I can use this language, right? Um, the other thing that's really cool in this diagram and this is a conjecture. So the Wall Street, the New York Times um, review basically tried to get, get at me. I basically tried to riff on this because a lot of what goes on too in, in, in sort of theory making, right? And also jazz music is that we riff. We make, mis we make mistakes. If I tell someone, get up here, get on my sax and just improvise. And if you go in thinking that you want to play something perfect, you'll freeze up. 
But if you go in knowing that improvisation is about making mistakes and learning how to fall in real time, right, then you could improvise. So it's about when you play that wrong note, you will. How, like an acrobat, you fall. And that is, becomes the interest in improvisation. So I riff on this, and I say this hat, this, if you look at this, um, this four-pointed triangle um, pentagram, I started to say, well, maybe this, was, this led to the, this pentatonic scale, this five-fold symmetry. Now, here's a puzzle that I haven't figured out yet, so maybe you guys can help me with this. The pentagram does have a, in terms of group theory, it has a five-fold symmetry, OK? It's, right, if I perform tran discrete transformations on the edges of this pentagram, it remains invariant in a five-fold manner. That's pretty cool. But if I start coloring this diagram with notes of the pentatonic scale, right, it's no longer invariant. Right? So the puzzle is, how do I make it invariant? And I suspect that the answer to that puzzle reveals something, I think, what Coltrane didn't reveal to anybody else. I think he left this as a puzzle to Yusuf Latif. Yusuf Latif was known to be like the, the, the guy of knowledge to all the jazz musicians. They used to drive out, get out to, to Detroit, Coltrane and like I think Charles Mingus and like ask him theory questions. So I think they had this kind of relationship, like, you know, like, just like Einstein and Gödel had, right? <laughs> thank let's, you. Let's thank uh, Stefan Alexander for. Thank you. Thanks for having me.